Amen. If you could, could you grab a Bible or on your phone, uh, look, open up to Mark chapter 16. Uh, you also have the words on the screen if you just want to follow along with me. But I do like watching, uh, uh, reading the scriptures together. And one of the traditions we have here is standing for the reading of God's word. So wherever you are, if you're able to, I would just encourage you to stand with me. I'll read it. And then at the end of the reading, I will say, this is the word of the Lord. And I encourage you to respond back, maybe even comment if you're able to. Uh, thanks be to God. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. Says this, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the, of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb. For trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may have a seat. And would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, this morning as we reflect on these words, we pray right now that your spirit would illuminate these words that in only the way that you can, in all of the different places that we are watching this and in interacting with this God, that you by your spirit would reveal, would resurrect our perspectives, Jesus. That you would draw us into these truths and that you would speak. And we trust, I trust that you will speak. Guard my mouth, Lord, against any distractions, detours, or wrong sayings that are not from you. May your gospel be proclaimed. And may we, even though we cannot physically be together, know that Easter is very much alive. And we invite you here to speak. We love you, we thank you, we praise you. And we pray this in the name of our resurrected Savior and King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever had a story where you wanted more, where you wanted a better ending? I know my wife and I, we've been uh, spending a lot of time on Netflix these days. And let me tell you, the last two series that we've watched have been this exact experience. We have invested so much in these characters where I feel like I love these characters. I care for these characters. I, I can't wait for this story. And in particular, this last series we end, one of the best, I'm not even gonna tell you what, what to watch because I don't want you to watch this show because the way that it ended, this character dies. And I remember it was like two in the morning because we, were, we had been binge watching because we couldn't turn it off. And, and finally we were like, we, we need to talk to the writers of this. And now we got to wait for the next season to come out and it just left us with like this horrible feeling in our mouth, this taste in our mouth, like there's got to be more to this. And I imagine as I read this story, the women are feeling like this and you and I, as we read this resurrection account in Mark, we kind of feel like this. Why does it end this story? Why does Mark end with this statement? They told nothing, they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Why, why were they afraid? 
Why did things not go as planned? As we look at this story, we can know from these ladies that this story did not go as planned. It's almost like as we follow along in the passage, they're stumbling their way to the empty tomb. It's like Jesus has just died. Their king, their savior, the Christ who was to come, the one who had been healing people, the one who just a week ago were were laying down palm palm branches saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And there's all of this expectation that he's going to save them and he's dead And it doesn't seem like there's another season for Netflix to release. It seems like, where do we go from there? And they're so just perplexed and flustered that all they know is they're going to go to the tomb. And it tells us that it's the Sabbath. The Sabbath had just passed. They had just spent probably the worst Sabbath of their life. Sabbath tends to be rest. It tends to be not doing much, kind of like isolation. And they were all by themselves. And in the first moment, as the sun is rising, they make their way to the tomb. But they're a little out of sorts. They want to see Jesus, but the Greek reads like that as they were talking to each other, they they knew that there was this giant stone that they couldn't move. And they weren't even prepared for it. They just kind of went to the tomb and they knew there were these problems ahead of us and they, and they had no idea how they were going to solve them. They didn't bring any of the big burly men to move the stone. They just went to the tomb and they were all out of sorts because the story had not been going the way that they planned. Their vision was all out of whack. And isn't that kind of where a lot of us may be right now? Some thought they would be having be preparing for a graduation or a senior prom. Some thought that their career would be taking off, that that the prices would be rising, that the crop would be coming in, that, that they'd be playing baseball or coaching baseball or watching baseball or the playoffs. LeBron versus Kawhi, what's going to be going on? And all of a sudden, this 2020 story is not going as planned. I find that so funny and profound or ironic, the word 2020 for this year. A word that is used about having clear vision that is being used. I remember for me as I was thinking about this, thinking as a church, we're going to have 2020 vision. We're going to rework our vision. We're going to bring all these things in. And we started the process and we're reading books and we're having these long brainstorming meetings and we're making all of these plans. And I kind of feel like God just slapped that lens right off our face. Like he just said to us this year, this is my vision. And I have no idea what that even means. And for many of us this Easter, as we think about the year 2020, it's not going as planned. And it seems to me, as I ask this question, why did Mark end this story this way with these women afraid, with these women fleeing and not doing what they're told? I think it's because we are meant to relate In this story, hear this, we are the ladies. And just like them, we stumble to empty places with our unfinished stories. We stumble to empty places with our unfinished stories. Maybe a little overwhelmed, maybe a little out of sorts. Maybe we just want to see him. And whatever those empty spaces may be, as we deal with these unfinished stories of thinking, I don't know how this will end or this is so messy, we start looking for different places to fill them and oftentimes those are empty spaces. Things like money, things like sex, things like substances or even in our own culture or even in our own religion, our pastor, our elder, that that YouTube 
person that we're watching, that podcast, whatever that may be, we run to these empty, but we don't really run. I like the word stumble because that's kind of what it feels like. And the question I've been asking is during all this, what are we stumbling to? For me, I think my default oftentimes is I stumble to my phone screen. To be honest, when I wake up in the morning, I I do want to read my Bible and reflect and pray, but oftentimes the first thing I do is I grab my phone and I look at what I missed overnight. I go to Twitter and I look at the most update on the virus or I go and look at what other churches are doing or what my friends are doing or or the the latest meme or I check on and literally I spend 10, 20 minutes looking and filling up my empty spaces with what everybody else is saying and doing. And I find myself stumbling through like these ladies to empty places. But what I love here is they do stumble to an empty place, but they don't know that it's empty because also we see that, yes, they stumble to empty places with these unfinished stories and all these questions. Who's going to move the stone away? How are we going to anoint this body? What are we going to do here? Hear this. The empty tomb reframes perspectives. The empty tomb reframes perspectives. Here's what I mean. This week, our staff has had a like, like full-on training on how to use video cameras and audio. And I feel like we're getting okay at it. Shout out to CJ and Lori and Katie and Doug and Nathan and everybody else on our staff, but especially those that are in the room right now filming with me. And one of the things I've been learning about cameras is there's this thing called fr- like frames and different angles, and lighting, and, and really perspectives. And if, you, and if you have a certain kind of lens, and you, and you have the focus on a certain thing, then, then the entire picture looks different. And, what, and it's been interesting like, to, to learn about that, and to see the difference it makes when you change what you're focusing on, and when your perspective is reframed. I also learned that this is a kind of therapy. We call this cognitive reframing therapy. When we think about our lives and we think about perspectives, oftentimes if we reframe our perspectives, that stumbling can be turned into a dancing, into hopeful perspectives. For example, I could think about this virus as the horrible year that Baseball was taken away from me, that sports, that ESPN was taken away from me, and I find myself watching marbles going down a screen and cheering for marbles. Am I the only one that saw that? But, or, or a time that Easter, our church couldn't gather together, or a time when the economy, you know, we could think of all the negative things, or I could reframe that perspective and think about how I imagine 20 years from now when my family looks back on these moments, this may be one of the most intimate, special times that our family has had together. That even right now as we worship, this may be one of the best Easter's you and I have ever had. Because all the trappings, because all the things that we add on are taken away and it's just us and God's word and these truths. Do you see the reframing that's happening here? And I think as I read this story, there's a reframing that is happening for these women. They are stumbling in. And as they stumbled, they thought the issue was the stone that was in the way. And all of a sudden, the stone is empty, and there's another whole perspective here, and there's this dude who's an angel. He says he's, he's, he's dressed in white, and he gives them some, how do you say this, some cognitive reframing therapy. They're processing, they're overwhelmed, and he is going to help them to reframe this story because the empty tomb reframes perspectives. And he says this in verse 6. He says to them, don't be alarmed. Now remember, whenever angels show up, it's terrifying and frightening. 
And they always say, don't be alarmed, don't be afraid. And these ladies are afraid. And he says, don't be alarmed. He says, you seek Jesus of Nazareth. Who was crucified? And here's the reframing. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? Look. Look. Remember how he spoke at the transfiguration that he would resurrect? This really happened. And the ladies right here, their whole perspective is being challenged and they're starting to think, what if he's really alive? And look at verse 7. He says this. Not only is this reframing from the angel happening, he says, but go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Do you see the invitation of grace here? Do you see the angel changing their perspective and offering them something that they don't deserve? And if you think, well, at least they deserve it, please remember here, these were women at that time, for God to show up and to speak to women in that culture. This is not the way you would want this story to go. If you were making this up, you would not put women in this story. You wouldn't. Because nobody would believe them. But God believes and empowers and uses women in his kingdom for his story. And we are reading this today because of the witness of these women and many, many more women today. And so just the fact that he is declaring this to these ladies is grace to them and that culture. But also he says, go and tell the disciples who all scattered and Peter. Do you not see the grace with Peter? Peter the one who declared to Christ, you are the Christ. And Jesus said on this, I will build my rock. Peter, the one who saw the transfiguration, who saw the glory of God, who, who, if you would think anybody would stay and follow, it would be Peter. And then when Jesus was on trial and people started to attack, Peter, the one who rejected, denied Jesus three times. He says, go and tell Peter. And for some of us, as we watch this, as we think about this Easter story, it can be easy to think, this isn't for me. This invitation from Jesus, it's a great invitation, but let me tell you what I've done. Let me tell you about the sins that I've committed, the wrongdoings that I've done, or I, I haven't been to church in forever. I haven't done all the things that you're supposed to do. And I would just imagine as you read this, just put your name there. Go and tell the disciples and Logan. This grace is an invitation for you, my dear friend. And as we read this, this reframes our perspective. It reframes these women's perspective. And the question for us this Easter as we think about this is what are you going to do at this empty tomb? Jesus says, go and tell. Jesus says, I am preparing a place. And the preparing, the language there is like, I am going into battle. Think like Braveheart. William Wallace leading the men in battle. That is what Jesus is saying here. I am preparing a place. Follow me. Tell the world these things. And the problem that we have is we default to verse 8 like these ladies. Jesus says, go and tell. But they fled and were terrified, trembling with astonishment. And it says they said nothing to no one, so they were afraid. And as I think about this unfinished ending, I think this is 
perfect. It is genius in the way that it writes because you and I want to finish this story. And you and I know that these women don't stay in this place, that they do go and share. Go look at, read the other gospels. But they have this place in this moment where they are petrified and paralyzed. And isn't that what so many of us feel in this moment? And they were afraid. And even though we know from everything we've read in Mark that Mark believes and has written this entire story about the Son of God, he tells us in verse 1, this is the good news of the Son of God. For you to believe. We are faced with this same question. And as I read this, and as I think about this story in 2020, I must be honest, I think I want to finish the story. I want to dictate how things will go. And where this ends is where a lot of us live. At empty tombs. Stumbling around. Going to empty places. Going to dead places. And here is what I want you to hear today. Here is the message for me. Don't stumble to an empty tomb with your unfinished story. Stumble to the Son of God who resurrects every perspective. Notice I didn't say reframes. Resurrects. The thing I've been learning about cameras is sometimes you just have the wrong lens on. And you can mess around with all the settings, but if you have the wrong lens on, you're never going to get the right perspective. And the truth of the matter is, because Jesus died and resurrected, there is a gospel of good news that all who are in Christ, all who put their faith in him, are given new lenses, are given new hearts, are resurrected themselves. And so when we stumble to Jesus, we don't stumble to empty places. We stumble to the Son of God, the glorious living Son of God who resurrects and resurrects our frames. And so as we think about this situation, as you think about your life, believe in this truth. It's not just about a reframed perspective. Jesus said, In John chapter 11, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asked this question, do you believe this? And in this story, the woman says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Do you believe this? You see, friends, it's all about what you focus on. And if we can focus in this moment, on this Easter, on Jesus, the Son of God, everything else fades into a blur. And my hope right now, right now in this Easter moment, is that with me, you would either Right now, proclaim your faith in Jesus, the Son of God, to say, I just believe, resurrect my perception, or maybe just continue to proclaim your faith in him and let everything else fade. Even with the fact that 2020 may seem unclear, that what is in front of us may be unknown, we can rest, my dear friend, in the love of Jesus. The last words that Jesus says in Mark is a cry on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those were his last words in Mark. And we know that he cries out, it is finished. And as we think about our unfinished story, recognize that Jesus finishes it all. And we live in this already not yet moment. And so wherever you are, I just want to encourage you this Easter to embrace these truths. 
to not just go to that cognitive reframing therapy, but to go to Jesus, the one who's not a therapist, but a savior, and who reaches in and changes and resurrects our perspectives. And so would you join me this Easter in praying to the resurrected one? Jesus, you are the Son of God. I believe that. And in this moment, I pray with my friends here and proclaim my faith that you came to earth, that you are the Christ, that you died on a cross for my sins so that I could live. And I believe that you resurrected on Easter so that right now as I pray, I know that I pray to a living God who has given me his spirit through faith. So we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would continue to counsel, to direct, to reconcile this world to you, and that you would move and work in all of us this year. We pray that 2020, even though it feels like a year of very blurry and unknown future, that we would know that it is not unknown to you and that you would make things clear. We trust you and we love you. And we thank you for dying for our sins. In your name we pray. Amen.